Welcome back to the Ryan Report, where we give you Ryan News produced for and by the culture. And welcome to another Two Black Tuesday. Where we give you our podcast every single week. You can find it on all platforms from Apple Podcasts to Spotify. And that is Two Black Runners, where you join with me, your host, Joshua Potts, and my brother from the same mother, Aaron Potts. Always in the building, bro. Aaron, how's it going, bro? We've bro, been having bro. some hot guests lately, some hey, great guests. I'm excited, we got one today. I'm excited for this one. We got a bona fide legend. So some people are going to enjoy this. And if you guys don't know about this, man, we really about to put y'all on. So... I'm super for excited for this one today, Josh. Yeah, bro. It's about to be an exciting. And we got to, first off, we got to give a shout out to Daniel Ozan real quick. The Daniel Joshua. Yeah, Check out his new, new single streaming on, on Apple Music, Spotify. The Boy, a.k.a. Coach O, for really just hooking up with this man. And, you know, I feel like the term man, myth, legend gets thrown around a lot you feel me yeah. a lot of people be saying that but when we're saying like we really got um the man the myth and the legend yes, today bro if you've been around in the club scene i could feel like if, especially if you've been around in southern california hey. or if you've been across the whole entire world in club track you have heard this man's name and you've heard what he's done in the 800 and the middle distance ranks we have the national record holder the national high school record holder in 800 michael granville bro michael bro how are you doing how's, yeah. how's everything going it's going pretty good considering you know that and, and what we're all going through in this world but like i said yeah you guys see it on the head the man the myth the legend <laughs> yes you know? you get prepared with the <laughs> I'm, old, I'm, old, I'm old enough now to go ahead and brag a little bit but you know but i really appreciate the uh intro and and i uh, look forward to you know talking track and life with you guys Hey, can I just say real quick for my our viewers, 146.45 in high school. That's crazy. Freshman year, 151. Like, like, who's, bruh. Who's we doing that? Dude, I'm who's, ready to dig into this one, Joshua. Start us off. It, this yeah. Is, yeah, this is an honor. It's an honor to have the Thank Michael Grambo on, on Two I Black Runners. It. But before we get into the meat and potatoes, I really want to talk about like this shelter in real quick. Cause I feel like your life has probably been heavily impacted as well. Because as you do that G Fit boot camp, like I just want to know like how how's everything going on your end so far? Uh, thanks, thanks for asking. Um my family's healthy. Uh we're all adjusting to the shelter in place. It was um, you know, just to go back six weeks ago. It's amazing how life changed so quickly. Mm -hmm. And it's been by the week, it's been changing. And um, what the, the biggest part was uh, for everybody's safety. And as I can kind of see the writing on the wall, once the NBA was was uh, shut it down and over here in, in our in Palo Alto area, Redwood City, that they were still wondering if we should still if we're going to have a track meet, we're still going to have meets. And I was just telling the athletes, I was like, you should come out here every day like it's your last day of practicing because we don't know when they're going to shut it down. You know, and that was just a way of me trying to coach them is like, no matter what happened tomorrow, today, bring your best. And I remember that's what I said the last day I was coaching that gun. And I said, come out here every day like it's your, your last. And that Thursday was the last day. They shut it down the next day. Um, it's been kind of hard, uh, very hard, just trying to figure out, you know, what you're supposed to say to your athletes. Yeah. Okay, uh, maybe it's going to open up. Maybe there's going to be a summer. And I'm just yeah. thinking at this point, it's just a, you know, Live your lives, just stay in shape the best way you can. And that was the second part, you know, besides you know, one, make sure your family's fine. Two, just let the athletes know, hey, just just be safe, do everything, listen to your parents. And then third, on my end, how I'm going to make an income and being a small business myself and, and, and seeing how I'm going to make this work. Back in December, I was wondering, I was like, okay, where is my program taking? Where is my program going? I'm, I'm the only person, I'm, I'm, I'm the owner i'm the instructor i'm the programmer i'm the marketer i'm so as a young as an entrepreneur you just have to do everything from leading to washing the toilet yeah. and yeah. I'm like, okay what am i going to do you know this is just me i would love for my sons to take over the business you know but they're 12 and 9 and whatnot so for the next 10 years this, this is me and so back in december i was like okay i need to start having an online presence i need to start having something online and in december i started doing some remote coaching for uh for some 
ultimate frisbee frisbee uh, athletes that were looking for for speed and agility, which I that is a big thing that I do. And from there to communicate, I started uh, logging into Zoom. And then come to start late February, it's just like I might have to use this for real, for real. Starting that time, I've been able to maintain my clientele. You know, there's some that's off, but I've grace to God, I've been able to gather a lot more during this crazy different times. Unfortunate, but very fortunate if it just happened to be at the right place at the right time, you know? Yeah. And sometimes it just works out. It works out like that, you know, but the thing is you, you gotta, you know, you gotta capitalize when you can. You always gotta be uh, looking forward to that next step. And it's no yeah, surprise it's a week that. Later, I, mean, I think just even a week later, I would have yeah. been late. <laughs> Cause that's when I started. I started looking at other programs. Started putting theirs on. So my my first Zoom was the first day we was in shelter in place. Dang, you so you were you were on it. You were on it. I, had, I, got, I got babies. I got babies. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a that's a whole other type of pressure. That's a whole other type of pressure. Yeah, man. Yeah, this got the work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Most most definitely. And I feel like. I feel like definitely when when people grow up and like that, I feel like there has to be a lot of influence that you have to get at like a younger age. So just talk about your upbringing real quick and what brought you to this wonderful sport and where you're at right now in your life. Um, so what brought me to this wonderful sport is my dad. My dad was a 600, 660 yard runner. He was all about running. Um, Mr. We have stories about Mr. Howard. Mr. Howard is Brian Howard's father brian howard is one of the california's fastest top maybe top 10 hundred meter runners maybe he won stay we're on the same west valley eagles team and i remember hearing these stories about brian howard coaching my dad in compton and they were all about you know the workouts grinding uh getting out there not uh just focusing on yourself putting in the work uh there's always somebody out there uh doing more and that's what I, my dad brought to the table so he secretly wanted me to, to run track. He would um, uh, race. I remember racing him kindergarten. I remember racing in kindergarten, and, and he would never let me win. Never let me win. <laughs> like, I was going all out. I'm going to beat this old man. And he wouldn't He wouldn't let me win. He was going full blast. And that just gave me that uh, that competitive nature. Like, I was doing push-ups at two years old. I, 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 I ran before I walked. You know, I went from crawl, mm. straight to run, fell down. And at that point, my dad was like, this guy is really about his, his comp competitive nature. I played chess. And um, I did something called Arco Jesse Owens. It was uh, a local uh, track meet in a series that led from, a, you know, your local area at Bell High School. And then you'll go and compete against people. With, I, don't, I think it was pretty much within the state, if, if that much. And, but it was a couple meets a year. A couple meets a year. Uh, my, again, my dad was all in the track, but I, he let me. I played a little baseball, mm -hmm. football here and there. But the, every now and then, it's like you know, the track, and then the '88 Olympics is the one that that really brought me over, just to see, you know, all that happened in Seoul, and then and then um, Butch Reynolds, the way he ran that 400, really mm -hmm. caught my eye. Edwin Moses, those were names that were said yeah. around our house. Flojo, obviously, Jack yeah. Jonah Kersey. And he kept saying, hey, this is some." actually he said it like this. We're not going to pay for you to go to college. You you got to find a way to get in on there. So this is a way you can get your college paid for. And they, I was hearing that since 88, 89, 1990. I was, my, my goal was basketball too. I wanted to play that. And I played some baseball and I can pitch. I was pitching 80, 85 miles an hour. I wasn't even throwing it to do a curveball. But if you throw it fast enough, it'll move, right? And a gentleman named uh, Haddad saw me running and on the baseball field. And he approached my dad and said, there's a team that's looking for somebody to run on a relay, on a 4 by one and 4 by 4 That team is the West Valley Eagles. West Valley Eagles is located in Canoga Park, Southern California, around that area. And a uh, couple notable names on that on that West Valley Eagles, Quincy Watts. Oh. Or the leader of... Uh, uh, Olympic champion in 1992, what? and somebody named uh, Marion Jones. Oh, you know, what? wow! Clear the slate, you know. Just so that's yeah. So that there's like no West Valley Eagles. So I remember I got my first pair of spikes. They invited me out to uh, some meet in Canoga Park. We had to leave six in the morning. And mind you, my dad was happy about this. He's like, okay, baseball is good. My son can pitch. He can't hit. 
but let's try this let's try this track thing out and so they drove us out to the Nova park the uh, they gave me my first pair of spikes to try on first uniform and uh they said here's the hundred meters I said, we want to see if you can make you know the team on the four by one here's a hundred meters so I get in the uh, starting position, which is stand and start for me at the time, which I didn't do any blocks. I was uh, 12 years old, around that, around that age. And it's me, yeah. that's what they called it. And so mm -hmm. everybody was in the blocks, and I'm the only one standing up. <laughs> Gun goes off, everybody goes in front of me, and then after about 20 meters, I passed them like they were standing still, came through the finish line in 11.99 seconds. At that time, the national record for the uh, youth, uh, midget boys was 11.98. Wow. And at that, wow. Point, at that point, there was just like, okay, uh, you are on the team. <laughs> yeah. I haven't looked back since. And this man. was your first your first meet ever? So so I did the art code Jesse Owens oh, yeah, in 88. Yeah, yeah. In 88, I did a 200. I did like a couple 200s a year in 88. That was 88. And then I don't remember running in 89. So 90 was the next time. Uh, we got on the track in the summertime, and so after that, uh, next thing I know, I'm on a train, uh, on, a, on a plane to Spokane, Washington, for the uh, Junior Olympics, AAU Junior Olympics, and that's when I met Obi. <laughs> and wait, can you talk a little bit about? That's when you first met Obi. Is that the first time you guys raced? And what event was that in? So I'm telling you, I'm off. I'm fresh off the pitching mound, mm -hmm. you know, and like, fresh off. And so I hit this hot time, and I uh, was happy about that. And, and and then having a plane ticket, you know, a plane ride, I'm still getting to know the guys' names on the team, girls' names on the team, the coaches' names. And, uh, and you know, so just liking the new blue and gray fit and flying, this whole, this whole deal. And so uh, at this point, my dad wants to put me in the 400. Oh, yeah, that's why. So now they want to see how I do in the 400, see if I can be in the 4x4. So I got myself locked in the 4x1. It's like, see if you can do a 4x4. All right. And um, I remember just before that, my dad jogged me to from Bell Gardens to Southgate, which is about two or three miles, and we ran to a park. It was a park about as big as my living room, so kind of small. And mm -hmm. he said, from this small patch of grass, you are going to change the world. You're going to you're going to take it to the next level. You can always look back at this patch of grass from humble beginnings. You're going to you know change the world. You're going to change at least my world. And we went to Spokane, and a couple of the athletes like all you can hear is a hum. Obi, 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 Obi. Everywhere you walk. Obi, Obi, That's Obi. how it is at club meets. There's just straight. There's just legends. <laughs> and every out there. Speed on. And I'm like, again, I'm telling you, I'm fresh off the mound. I'm just understanding people's names. I'm learning how to put on spikes. Yeah. And then other than that, I hear is Obi, 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 Obi. What's an Obi? What's an Obi? <laughs> What's an Obi? And uh, I think of Star Wars or something or something. And they show me this guy, nice shaved head. At the time, I had him probably about a foot and a half. And it's like, that's Obi. And back of my head, I was like, I got Obi. I got Obi. Yeah. And my dad, he was a student in the sport. He kind of kind of talked around and, and found out who Obi was. And he said, hey, you know this kid, Obi, they talking about? He goes, yeah, he's for real. All right. So this is what I want you to do. I want you to take it out. And my dad cussed a little bit. I'm not going to cuss, but my dad said, you take it out on him. And uh, when he and then let him catch up to you at the 200 meter mark. Let him pass you. You could give him that feeling. Like, go for it. Don't let him get more than 10 yards away and then try to walk him down. Like he would see, he felt like he's like, and plus I was running the 400 for the first time. So he wanted, he's like, get out for the first 150. Like, like that's the last race you go run is 150 meters. He says, and then just chill and wait for him to come through. Luckily, Obi was on the inside lane. I got a video. I'll show this to you guys. It's, it's on there. So anyway, that's all uh, they started off. I was probably in lane seven, six or seven. He's in lane four, and it's a black track in Spokane, Washington. And then we, I get out, high socks, you know, ASIC spikes, leading at the 200 meter mark. And then you see in the video, Obi just took. He came. He came and swooped me up like he did everybody in his early track career. Swooped me up. He probably wasn't used to being that behind at that point. That's probably what happened. 
And he swooped me up on that turn. And I knew, I was like, dang, daddy was right. This is what he said was going to happen. And so I just like, I said, but this kid is moving. And so I just was like chilling. And then you can just see coming off the turn where I thought he was 10 yards ahead, but he was probably 15. Mm. And at that point, I was like, this is what my daddy said to catch him. So I was like, all right, let me catch him. And I came down and looking back at the, at the video of it, I can't remember the time, but since looking at the video within the past two years, uh, you can just see me catching up to him. I caught a bead on him. But then after that, the crowd gets in the way. So all you see is the last part was this distance on the, on the screen. Then you don't see anything. You see people just like kind of going, oh, this is what we do. They're not even looking. Then you hear a hum. Ooh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and, and then as, a, as the screen cuts back in, you see me chop in on them come across the line, we both lean. I still think I won. I still think I won. Uh, but they gave me a close second. They, then, then they tried to disqualify me. So they tried to disqualify me saying, oh, you ran out of your lane coming to catch up. Because they, a conspiracy theory is like, nobody's supposed to be doing this to Obi. So you must have been out yeah. of your lane. So no, I was like, no, nah, no. Nah. We, we had the camcorder on it. We gave him the video. It's like, all right, all right, you took second place. Meanwhile, I'm, I'm like, what's going on? Like, <laughs> I just ran like a 54 seconds, you know, in the 400 at 12 years old. And, and this guy, and ever since then, Ogre and I has been, you know, battling or during the 90s. We, we were battled just like that, you know, every time we would race. Yeah, for y'all that that's, don't that's know, just really... I was just going to say, for y'all that don't know, Obi Moore, another, another California uh, legend, ran 45-14. In high school, Google them if you don't know. But go ahead, Joshua. Bro, I, I was, I'm just really curious how you said, like, on your club team, you had Marion Jones, you had Quincy Watts, Crazy. and then even your high school career and during club, you raced against Obi Moore. You raced against like greats, like legends, like people that went on to win Olympic gold. Yeah, just like. How do you think that really like shaped you from a young age? Cause I feel like for me and Aaron, we can attest to this from ourselves, like being around people in like club track that go on to be in the NFL or like going on to be in the Olympics. Like we've been around a lot of like talented individuals. How did that shape you being around the best of the best at such a young age? Um, it made you think it was possible. Mm -hmm. It made you think it was attainable, you know? And at that time, it gave you that extra reason to get up and do a push-up, uh, extra reason to go out there and and do that Saturday workout where you felt like, why? You know, because yeah. you'll, have, you'll see that Quincy Watts and you see what happens. You see a Marion Jones at the time just making it look so effortless. And you, then you'll see them working out and know why they, they're in the position that they were in. Um, mm -hmm. Another part, too, is just you just um, – you want to su surround yourself with greatness because there's no falling back on it. And at this age, looking at it now, I'm like, what is it all about? And it's just putting yourself in a position to be with those like-minded people, those amazing people. And just like we are right now, dealing with a two or three amazing gentlemen. Yeah. And because of this one oval that put us together, that put us in that, that hard work and everything. And it's all about just that community of effort of like-mindedness of good people but that's it again that's more than an adult but back then it was something that was like attainable there's somebody that is doing it that's not that much older than me and is doing everything that that's right to make it to the next level and it's showing and so um and then it was it, it was um, a little competitive you know if, if you know, obviously i'm not racing marion jones a angela williams there's uh, a lot of slew of names there was uh, you know obviously obi uh, Tyree Washington. I mean, there was a every week, and especially in California, if I wasn't competing against you, I definitely was competing. You know, at least for a little article in the newspaper, or at least for a little extra highlight, because mm -hmm. there was no Instagram, and there was no, yeah. you know, Facebook, and there was no TikTok, and you know, and the way yeah. you, got, you know, at least record, at least you get recognized was three days later in the Sunday paper, you know, and we waited for that. Um, and I was going to ask as well, like me and Joshua, we grew up doing club. I'm a little bit older than Joshua. And I felt like I caught like the tail end of club track when it was like at its height. But I feel like 
in the 90s and in, in your time it was a whole different type of energy man like can you can you describe that a little bit yeah thanks for bringing that up because um i think now there's this sports are saturated where you got you know there's soccer is this and that but back then you know it's it was uh, a, a very a frugal sport that you can get involved in besides with traveling but as far as just the talent and just being the peak of club sports yeah the 90s was the time mm -hmm. we had uh i mean texas schools we had florida schools and everybody's records breaking every year and um i remember too i mean it was just the, the the 800 was start at 12 o'clock and they'll say it on the on the program but you probably wouldn't run till three it was so many races yeah. <laughs> so many you know and i was thinking why are people running 800 why are people running the 400 but people were you know athletes coaches it was huge i mean west valley eagles that was a hot team la jets that that was another top team we had the um was the bears what was the cut the uh so the cheetahs oh can't forget the cheetahs Southern Cal Cheetahs. Those Quiet, are, did y'all quiet fire still back then? Quiet fire. I know about quiet fire. Now, yeah, quiet fire was around still. Too. Were you on quiet fire? No, but quiet fire was legendary when we ran because every time someone on their team would win a race, they would start singing fire. Yeah, the whole, the, <laughs> and they had a whole bunch of people on their team. It was, it was Love crazy. It. Love it. Was it. Crazy. I uh, in the young man on the quiet part that broke my eighth grade record. Elias. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's, we're actually, I'm, yeah, that's one of our, our I'm actually good for we're friends with him. He's one of the homies. But yeah, he was yeah. a legend. He was a, he was yeah. a legend too in club. Yeah. You go to the meets, what race is Elias in? Who is he racing? So like, definitely understand that energy. And I feel like for you, we were talking about it. We were looking back at the all-time list in the 800 and just all over in the 90s for high school as well yeah. like the it was crazy specifically in la like especially with you and you and obi but there are other people like joshua oh, yeah. like there was like nine guys under 150 that year well, that one year right and that's that one year so we had um my junior year for sure arcadia there was three four people under 150 at arcadia in april right uh, but as far as everybody, I mean, we had the Levine brothers up up north. They were towards the tail end of our 90s route. But starting at the beginning, we had like Brian Woodward and then Vondre Amore, you know, in 1993. And then Vondre Amore and me in, in 94, where it, it seemed like each year it went down to a lean and except, and except for my, my senior year. And then the next year after that was the Levine. I mean, there was, every year it, it was, there was no chill you know it's, unless you're doing a league meet or something and then the way my dad coached me league meets were workouts so i'm running at one the eight and the four boom 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 you know <laughs> and, and doing some repeats afterwards or something pushing a cadillac that's what I, from club to to high school to 800 being the hottest event for a couple of years there was no chill man no chill so it, it put me to the point where i felt like i needed to perform i didn't want anybody close because it, yeah. you know if you go to me we also brought that up too, how we were saying like, was the 800 like the, like one of the premier events then too, where like everyone was like, oh, we got Michael and, and Obi and this guy racing, like everybody sit back, like it's about to be crazy. Or even the four too, cause you guys have people, you guys have most yeah. of the guys around 45. I think, yeah, I think the 400, I mean, the, the Harrison brother, Harrison twins was doing their, their thing back when I was there and, and they ended up going like 45 seconds. So every year there was somebody going 45. I ended up going 46 myself. But um, I, I think the 800 was premier event because there was it got to a point where I've even heard too. They was putting money in the stands. Who's gonna get them? Who's gonna get Michael Vicky? So it was a lot of gambling going on in the stands. And and when I think I get this from some reliable sources, some reliable sources. And I heard it from my uncles before. But I just let that slide. When I heard it from some people re recently, it said, "You know what? The biggest, the biggest draw besides seeing you guys run, we'll see who's gonna, who's gonna, you know, get the big money. You know, who's gonna uh, take me down or something or whatever." So, and especially my my senior year at Arcadia, it was they said it was probably the most money exchanged under the stands in any Arcadia event. You know, I'm not trying wow. to talk about this, but 
<laughs> so, but, but not to just to my own horn. Trust me, like I said earlier, even though I wasn't competing against other athletes in 100, 200 field events, it, 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 as soon as the 800 was done, there was another highlight event, you know, in the hurdles. There was another highlight event in the 32. There was another highlight 100 event, in, you know, in the pole wall. We had Scott Slover going 16, 17 feet in high school. We will always compete against who was the athlete of the meet. So we were really gun. And I think that's a big part of just having having somebody like me that was just hitting those times. And it was reliable of, of having a, a sub 150. Well, maybe bring that out of somebody else. You know, just like, hey, you just carry it along. On me on my end, my the first the, the, the carrot in front of me was the Olympics. The carrot in front of me truly was to break every national record there was. My my goal was to hit 144, 145 every time. You know, and and that was my drive. My drive, 300 put I tell my athletes I did 300 push-ups, 300 squats, 300 sit-ups every day just so I can breathe right, you know, and just because I, I made me feel good. And that was my carrot in front of the stick. But then with me having that, I'm pretty sure I brought in a couple of other brothers, maybe a couple of other sisters in another event and say, you know, if he's pushing like that, let me take it to the next level. And that's why I believe we've seen like that many sub 150s in the mid 90s. This is my my last okay. little comment I want to say on on, uh, on on that. But I'm sorry, Joshua. But I just wanted to say, like, okay. I feel like 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 you said about the, the push ups and stuff. I feel like your era, like my dad, my dad. You guys were built like dads back then. I mean, I feel like our dad did this with us. Like the a funny thing is my dad told me that he used to come to my elementary school when I was in kindergarten and when we used to race and he would be there yelling for me to like cheer me on, like acting like crazy, you know? And I remember one time too, my dad, he was like, I was like, yeah, bro. Like I've been doing like like 200 push-ups a day, like when I was in college competing, he was like, I, I did 500 when I was in Boston. <laughs> so I felt like your era like built a, there's a different type of athlete in that era. And like, yeah. how do you, why is it, why is it a little different now? Or like, what do you think about like the current state of like, of of the millennial athlete or the gen, is it what, Gen Z, Gen X Gen athlete Z. or something? Gen yeah, X. so, um... Well, on my end, uh, you know, I grew up below the poverty level. Uh, there was, there was no other option. You know, there was other options. Yeah, you can, get, you can. There's other options, and then there's a positive options with school and training. And 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 immediately, what's different now to then? Immediately, what's different now to then is technology, is information, is avail- availability of information. Uh, back then was. You listen to your coach, you listen to your dad, and depending on how the dice may roll, maybe that person knows a little bit more than the next person. Maybe this person would just throw a lot of eggs on the, against the wall, and the one that didn't crack is the one that you keep, you know. But but there was there was something, and I, I, if I can, I said it in one of my other interviews where growing up it was Muhammad Ali, and you know besides Jesus, Muhammad Ali, and it was the Rocky movie especially the one Rocky four, where you can see Rocky going in the snow, doing the logs, doing this, mm. uh, running in the snow up hills, pushing cars. And so not, and again, not being at this point in this position, we need the scientists. We need that availability and in, 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 uh, information. I think it's really helpful for athletes now to have that and, 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 and have that available. But what I think that takes away from is, okay, now I know it, but what about the do it part? You know, it's yeah. the do it part. And okay, I know this is what you can pick and choose. You know what? I can pick. I like this. I like that. Okay, what I'll do is I'll do the hills. But, but they didn't say that in the 80s and 90s. They say you do your 300 push ups, you do your because somebody else is going to do it and beat you. I mean, I hear, once I heard Flojo was doing it and I seen Flojo's muscles on top of muscles, so I was like, oh, that's what I'm going to do. And secretly, I wanted to be a football player. So mm. <laughs> I was trying to get small. Like not not exactly having that access to information makes you feel like I got to just do everything instead of like now it's like like you're saying, oh, I'm, I'm going to do this, this, this is going to work. And it's like, no, you need to just put everything into it. Put it in there. And that's that's my advice is, OK, you know, do something for sure. The the the, the best workout that's going to get you to the podium is the one that you're going to do. OK, let's have that. Let's have that there. The one that you're going to do, if you like those 
those repeat 400s, those repeat threes or something, or a repeat half milers. If, if that's something that works for you, you want to keep it, yeah. But there's the other stuff that you always think twice. It's like, oh, I don't feel like doing it. That's probably stuff you should do too, as far as working out. Yeah. And I would get up, you know, and to the, you know, and I, I would do my squats. I would do my heel raises, jump roping. Uh, uh, my dad had a gym. And it, it was every year we'll just add a new piece of equipment, a heavy bag, you know, a jump rope, maybe some dumbbells. And every day, you know, I, I did play my video games. I, you know, I stayed up too late sometimes doing that. But when the end all be all was I loved to work out. And I felt like there was a, a great transition from, from doing that, the stuff that people don't see. And then it showed when it was time to show. You know, that's why I would uh, uh, every day, you know, do my push. I would jump rope a thousand jump ropes without missing. I would speed back, speed back to where you just couldn't see the ball because it was full of sweat. You know, just and that and there was nothing else to do, too. There's nothing else to do. You know, <laughs> it was, no out, you know, hanging out. It was this is this quarantine life is pretty much what yeah. my life was back. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't go out with no friends and do nothing like that. I, 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 you know, I read my Bible in the morning. I did my push-ups. I entertained my brothers and sisters with a group of five of us, and and uh, and that, and that was it. And that was it. I'm taking notes right now, y'all. I'm taking notes right now. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> Man, we gotta find this. But then to speak it on to all those sacrifices and all that hard work, blood, sweat, and tears that you put into that, that real glory day that you had, well, that first real glory day that you had, had to be that 146 and when that state prelim in 1996, just take us through that real quick and that race and the decision of that day of going out there, breaking that record onto specifically that day and how it just felt afterwards to just have that load out for your back. Huh. So um, that whole year, you know, you know, so I've, I've had all the records leading up to that. Eighth grade, eight, eight hundred meter record at 156. Ninth grade, 151. Tenth grade, 148. Eleventh grade, 147. And here I am just floating around with 148s and 147s my uh, senior year. Uh, there was a lot of wind blowing uh, that year. I remember also, too, um, spraining my ankle just before uh, preseason playing basketball. That was another level. I was dunking since the eighth grade. It, it's, it was just one of those things where was a passion of mine just to dunk on somebody. And everything just – it's just something when, when you do something that you wasn't supposed to do, and it felt like it, and the first thing you think about is that statement. It's like, man, am I ever going to run my senior year? Fortunately, I got everything healed up, and that year, 96, was – you know, Olympic year, that was a goal of mine. That was the one of the main goals. Second goal was to get the national record from uh, George Kirsch and Pete Richardson. There was a, I unified the belt, but there was a 147 time and a 146 five time. And so all this stuff was was in my dad's mind. We had a, a wall. I can't think of all the names of Mag, but my dad was, again, he was a student of the sport. He would go to the library, he'd get old newspapers, and he will find everybody that had a faster time than me or, or at some point uh, ran a certain time in, in an event or won a certain event. And he had their news articles up again over the wall. So that year, every time I would pass somebody up, he would take their name off the wall. He would snatch the next one up. It was like, and then it was down to a couple, George Kirsch and uh, Pete Richardson. And uh, so good, leading up to the event, it was uh, prelims. Uh, I can tell you the story beforehand. My, uh, we had a, you see, it's the same day. So we had a, uh, the school was honoring my sister. My sister and I in the same grade, she skipped the level. She was school uh, salad victoria in Shalora. And so she uh, got the second uh, award, salad victoria. And I got like the fifth or sixth top GPA. And they were doing some other honors for seniors. And so we went there. My dad didn't show up. My parents didn't work. So my dad was at home. My mom drove us in the Cadillac. Came a little, we came back late from the ceremony. And this was a morning ceremony. The, pr the principals were okay with me just going in and leaving. It's like, you know, he got some stuff to do. Just come get the award. <laughs> and then go back home. It's like, <laughs> I was still in good grade. So I guess I had that love. But, um, 
And so uh, we got back late and my dad was a big part of being on time. And he felt like we, my, he felt like my mind wasn't on the prize. And, um, and he was pissed off to all those things that was on the wall. He tore everything down and it got even more wild. And I just remember sitting down. The one thing that really stands out that that morning was my younger brother. He comes just like I'm sitting down right here. You probably wouldn't see his head. You see a little afro come right here and go right into my armpit. I can, I can feel it right now. He goes, Tutu, whatever you do, break that record today. And we both was looking stoically forward. It was like, all right, I will. And uh, just remember that day and and my dad broke his silence. We both looked at each other and he said, Mike, they're like, what? He goes, the wind is not blowing. This is the time to do it. I was like, what? Is he talking about the wind's not blowing? I'm over here thinking about all crazy shit. And he's like, the wind's not blowing. This is the day. This is the prelims. This is the day. And I look, and he's right. It was the, the flags, the little triangle flags, which were blowing all year. I felt like every race was a headwind around the track. And this time there was no wind. And so gun got off. Nobody was expecting this besides me and my dad. Yeah. I get out, and uh, so I guess I had a little love in that. So I had a little, you know, a little cushion to, to fall back on. But I remember getting off that that first turn, saying that I'm getting I'm getting out. I'm getting out. And I always got out around 24, 25 when it when it counted because I just didn't like just people around me. You know, just people. I just needed to get out so I can think. And so I got out, and then I remember just cruising, just cruising that. Uh, next 200 going into the four, but again, like, can't really remember too much. I remember getting out, and then I remember going into the bell. And my whole thing, I remember hearing, so as soon as I hear that bell, I'm going to sprint. I'm just going to, I'm not going to build into it. I'm going to act like I got out of the blocks again and go. And sure enough, because I was like, I'm going to end it. Like, 600 is going to be the last time people see me. So I'm just like, wow, come around that turn, elbows and Ads, it's, just, yeah, it's going and going into the 600 my dad is usually right there and i was just wondering just like okay i'm gonna ignore him when he say something but anyway i'm just and i never heard him say anything i was like whoa and i just felt like i was in no one no man's land on that final turn coming coming home and then two i just came through and i was like i am not sore right now like i am feeling okay after all that, I feel fine. And that was like the kind of conversation I was having in my mind. I was like, what's, what's happening? So uh, yeah. I come across the 700 meter mark. And that's when I heard my dad the first time ever that he was on the 700 meter mark. And he told me 129. I remember hearing like 129, 130. I said, oh, shit. So this is, <laughs> so I, I took off again. I was like, you do the math. You're like, this is going to be something. So I took off again, and then the last 50, truly, I felt both feet on the ground at the same time. I can hear the crowd. I knew something was happening, and but I was just like, just, just make it through, make it through. I, I hope I don't fall. You know, just all the different things, just form, knees up, don't waste the energy, don't look back, all these different things, just telling yourself. And I came across, and you can just see 146 on there, and... Uh, I remember. I remember at that point, I went. I looked at the stands, and there was two of my good friends uh, from high school happened to go to that meet. And a lot of, you know, a lot of people weren't going to meets from my high school, but they said they. That's what I remember now. They were, they were saying, you know, I think this is the day you're gonna do it. And that, and we told me that they told me that, and they went there, and I remember seeing it was Juan and Burn Dog, Burn Dog and Juan. We were part of our little dog pound. That's what we called ourselves, our lunch break dog pound. And I, was, I pointed to them, I mean, and seeing from the video, I popped their hands. And then walking back, you can just hear the announcer. Um, uh, just recently, I got the video from, uh, one of the videos from this. And just hearing, uh, uh, you don't really see, my, see me running so much, but just hearing the announcer go through the race is just true history. Just to hear maybe what people were going through seeing it. And, I'm, and I've heard so many people tell me that they were there. And they had to tap the wall and say, are you watching this? Are you watching this right now? Like, this guy is actually, he just came across at 51 seconds. Yeah. I think he's doing something. And they're like, and then toward the last 200. So 
ends up breaking the, the national record. Uh, that moment was, it was a feeling of accomplishment. It was a feeling of like, all right, fine, I, I'm good. I, I'm done. That's exactly what I said. I said, I'm good. I don't need to do anything anymore. And he was like, you know, I'm happy for you, this and that. And I said, I'm done. And he was, what do you mean? I was like, I am not running. I'm, I'm done with all this running stuff. And he said, Mike, nah, you, you got to come out tomorrow. You have to come out tomorrow. You got to complete the process. And, you know, I was thinking about stuff that was happening earlier. There was things just trying to figure out, like, what am I in this sport for? I got everything. I, hey, I, I checked all the boxes as far as, you know, records is, is concerned. And I was like, F it. I'm done. And he, we talked all night. We talked all night. He says, okay, how about this? How about this? Just go out and run the first 200 and then just jog the rest until somebody tries to challenge you. And if you feel like going for it, go for it. And then if not, you know, he knew I would be competitive, but he just needed to get me to the line. And so the next day I agreed and I went to the line and that's the race that's on YouTube. Uh, uh, another race that's on YouTube, the, the finals day. And I get out. I get out like I usually do. And it's funny, the next day, so it was probably about 10, 12,000 people there on the prelims day. Just And it was packed. It was definitely packed. The next day, people were hopping fences. They were <laughs> licking the, uh, the stamp to get the stamp. It would have to been over 20,000 people there that day. Cool. Over the stairs, yeah. just like, oh, we know he's going to do it again today. I apologize to all you guys for the <laughs> <laughs> The next day, but hey, I was just happy to be out there looking back at it now. I'm glad I did go back and, and complete the process. <laughs> I was just going to say, going back uh, to the state meet. So after the state meet, you win, and then you almost didn't even run state finals. No. But you end up you end up going to UCLA and having a career there. What was that, what was that summer like? When you're going into that summer, because I know you had colleges all over you since you were probably a freshman. Um, oh, my, yeah. I, I, I remember in 1990, uh, USC said, hey, whenever you're uh, ready to go to college, we, we got you. Uh, in 1990, I had caught this guy. So, Obi was in this that same year I was starting track. Obi had put like a 80 meter lead on us, and then I had to stick next, and I caught that lead and uh changed my whole track life and it was just like hey uh boy you're illegal and whatever you want so yeah i've had some some colleges uh talking to me my whole thing was was wanting to go pro i wanted to go pro right i said just kind of keep the dynamic of my dad and i coaching which i thought you know there was some it was tough but the dynamic i think was it worked you know so it worked as far as uh the times and everything um my dad said, you need to go to college. And so I went to the uh, uh, Olympic trials and made it to the to the second quarter finals, almost made it to semis. And then the summer leading up into college was just trying to figure out, man, how's this going to work? Part of me was just like, you know, because I would, I would train as a boxer. I would run on grass. I would run by myself. You know, I, I wasn't a part of a team. Yeah. You know, a team dynamic, like, okay, this person is going to lead this interval. This person, gonna... it was me and my sister, and it was two different speeds. Yeah. But um, so that was that was the whole thing, getting into college. But just, just the first year, I was just trying to figure out who am I as a, a teammate? Who am I as a person that's broken every record and has, you know, the weight of the world, I felt at the time, on my shoulders on how – to progress, like how can I continue on this this train that, that that I've been on rolling? And there were some hard times. There was some really hard times. I was I was definitely a target. I remember getting taunted in my freshman year of, of high school, of high school of college, uh, just in the relay. You know, and, and people are running fast. Before you can be, you know, 20 meters ahead of somebody within a couple steps, there was no distance between them, you and the next guy. And that's practice. You know, there was we had, you know, world-leading runners in practice. We had Ibrahim uh, Hassan, who was a 44 high second meter, a 400 meter runner, right there on, on the campus. We had Jeff Strutzel, who took second behind me, was now really starting to make his key. He ended up being one of the fastest Bruins ever at 145, besides Corey Prem. And so it, it was, it was um, a wake-up call. It was an adjustment. It was trying to figure out how do I fit in as an athlete in, in, in this 
prestigious school and this this coaching staff and then you have these professional athletes that are intermingled within your day of so you just have all you got Otto Bowden, John Drummond, you have Marie Jose Perret, you have Quincy, you have just before your practice, you having these all stars, right? Maurice Green, right in front of you doing block work in the beginning of the dry phase. So I started to become a student of the sport at that point. I started to understand knowing people's names, understanding like, okay, how does John Godina train for the shot put or Celala Sua in the discus, uh, Mebrado Kafleski. So I'm just at this point, I'm being more of a student of the sport more of a teammate and and it's just crazy besides my freshman year i remember just figuring out like i felt like i was on an island i was like man i'm out here doing some sport that my dad wanted me to do and at the time he wasn't a part of my life anymore i remember shaking my head i was um invited to mount sack invitational for you know the big boy event for the 800 meters and i remember talking to my dad like hey, this is the time i'm running this was so this is it and I looked up to see if he was there and he wasn't there. I was like, you really by yourself? So it just took, it was, it was, it took a lot out of me to find, okay, reinvent myself in the sport. Like, why am I out here? And then from that point, it took a bit, but it, it was become a, a, a great teammate. It's become a student of the sport. It was become uh, eventually a coach like I am now, just to really learn. And it, 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 you can imagine how I feel, how I felt every year getting slower <laughs> what and I, not, I wasn't putting in work I was putting in work I was there every, you know hitting the weight room I was you know bouncing back between you know a sprints and, and distance I would get hurt and it's just like what's going on nothing you know I did have a good time have a good time I have great friends that's last a long time that's something that I didn't have before like it was more of a social life after my sophomore year but but there were still, I remember looking back at some of my notes and, and writing down my goals of wanting to hit 144 and my questions of what's going on and I'm doing everything. And it was just one of those moments or a slew of moments that just, one, just let me have to believe what, how do I exist in this sport? Mm. I almost don't want to tell anybody about my records anymore because I'm not anywhere close to that. I still feel like I can make the Olympics in a, so I switched to the 400, you know, and and I think because the 800 was just, it was just eating in my brain that last 200. And I remember every time where I felt like before I would press this, uh, this button, this figurative button in my head, and that was my kick. All right, now, now hit the button and I would, I could run a 27 the last, so I feel like I can do that. But when, and then as I got older, when I felt like hitting that figurative button, just wasn't, wasn't delivering. And so I felt like it was mental. Looking back at it now, I probably should have went in and, and seen a psychiatrist, a sports psychiatrist, which I just somebody to, to dig deeper in. What is it? You know, and I've had friends since talk about that. But but anyway, um, I decided at that point, it's like, let me try the 400. And so all my years of, of running the 800 and all my uh, accolades and records, like 146 definitely is up there. But there's something that I did that I, I give to myself is like, you did this, you, I mean, with the help of coaches, but you dug deep and you found a way to, you found that champion on the inside. And um, the, what, 2000, my senior year, I was feeling that this is the year after we um, had a really successful run in the four by four in, in 1999 uh, NCAA championship in, in Idaho. And we ended up winning and, um, or, and hit that 45. So I, that whole year, I, I, I just trained as a, 400 meter runner going up until 2000 March. I was doing one more block start just to prepare for the um, dual meet that weekend. And I pulled my hamstring, something nasty. And, and so I was just like, are you serious? This is going to be the year. I came back. I did acupuncture. I, I did physical therapy. I worked as hard. I worked my butt off. I had to end up, you know, when I got back, it was not 100%. It was 80%. They put me in the 1500. I ran four minutes. In the 1500 reluctantly and i was just like ah and eventually i got a qualified for the 400 meters for the pac-10 championship i get there and they um they only have enough people for one heat so we don't go we don't do the prelims they move it right to the finals the next day which gave me a little love because they gave my hamstring a little i didn't have to hammer it twice and by the grace of god man i was i was uh in last place with the last 110 meters to go and something just clicked. That button worked. That button worked. I hit it. 
in the last 100 meters, I came down the line and won a Pac-10 championship. It was one of the slowest times to ever win a Pac-10 championship, but it was one of those things I look back on as like, there's something where I dug deep and found a champion within to finish my, pretty much what I thought at the time at the end of my track career with the win. So that that's pretty much sums up my, I mean, what will sum up my UCLA college career is, oh man, the, the support, the the uh, lessons learned, the, but mostly the support I got from my fellow athletes. You know, they they understand, they definitely was um, in all of what I did in high school, but even more so, they see me as a team captain. They see me as somebody that's a, 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 as a hard worker. They see me as somebody that has a sense of humor that they made it fun to go to practice. And mm-hmm. and uh, through that, there's some there's some bonds that you know will never be broken. And that's one thing I get from college. And then next thing I know. I get called up to uh, uh, Palo Alto, California to run for the Nike farm team after I hung up the spikes from Coach Frank Gagliano. Have you heard of Frank? You know Frank Gags? If you Coach, ever... See Coach Brenda Martinez? Coach Gags? Or what is he? Probably at one point, probably at one point, well, he was a Georgetown coach uh, for the longest time, and now he's at Hoka. Maybe he's coaching... Oh. Coaches New York, New Jersey. Oh, yes. 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 That's yes. still going. He's in his 80s. And he was great. He, he was, I, I think, I, I thank him so much for getting me up here for one. Once I moved up here after three days with seeing people riding bikes and bike lanes and being about their fitness, I'm like, putting the flag down. This is where I'm going to raise the family. This is where I'm going to live. Again, I didn't run as, as anywhere close to as fast as I could, but it was just one of those great environments to train with and seeing these elite athletes, you know, take it to the next level and, and seeing track. These are the years where I really start to like track and, and take it in as a fan. Because before I was running track, I couldn't tell you a name of anybody because it was just, you know, push up in, in sprints, man. <laughs> yeah. And I just feel like, I mean, I feel like a lot of athletes go through what you went through at UCLA at some point in their life, where the, whether it's after running or before or after running or like in college, but I feel like there's always a silver lining. There's more, there's more to track and field that you're going to learn from just winning or running fast times. Cause like for most people, I mean, you're going to lose most of your races and those yeah. are just, those are lessons. Yeah. And that's how life and life and life, you're going to lose, you're going to lose a lot. It doesn't mean you're not going to win, but if you're going to lose a lot. That means you're going to learn a lot. Yeah. And I feel like that's what really, that, those are the moments that shape you into the person you're going to be. Uh, you, you hit it on the head. I mean, that's that, just being a coach. Those are the those are the moments where I pull from to help out. Yes, I can tell my athletes, you know, I, I have a team, you know, about 150 kids. And I want to say maybe 70, 80 percent of them just out there for the camaraderie with their, with their friends to get out of P.E., mm-hmm. uh, to get in shape or to try it out. Then you have your handful that have aspirations of going to the state meet or or having the school record or even knowing what a record is. And and so I dig a lot of my learning experiences from those times of not being at the top, those times of, of fighting my way for fifth place or find my way to be on on a, on a relay team just to get in into the national championship, you know, and, or each day in practice just to fight out just even, just the normal routines of how you get out there and push yourself through injury. You know, how did I do that? And I tell a lot of my athletes, I, I said, you're going to, people get injured. You know, that's something that's happened, but that's not the time to be just to disappear. Be that's the time to be even more close. Be, that's the time to really uh, understand your body and do all the little intangible stuff. That's going to get you back. And this is a time to, to immerse yourself. Maybe take some notes, maybe take some times for me really be involved you never know what happens down the line and all these learning experiences can be very lucrative in the future you know and i was talking to joshua like like i was saying you're 146 because some people they'd be like michael graham would be around 40 around 146 but he didn't do anything at ucla but i'm like that that's not michael you don't know michael granville like that's not the end of his story that 146 opened up so many opportunities to you yeah which led to you, you know, creating this amazing family. You got G Fit going and and I mean I it 
all of that that 146 that was a big day in your life and it it yeah. honestly just snowballed and you took advantage you took advantage of it and yeah it got to, my you, got to you know, where you are today you, you find you know, that's one thing you find in business you, you know you find your niche you know there's all these different fitness programs out there and these apps and these other boot camps well, what makes mine work you know and and so i definitely use that track background that 146 that understanding of how to push yourself and then and, and market it that way and then just having a, a team oriented person and being a just having a sense of humor you know and just kind of putting sense of humor uh track background and just obviously just knowing everything i can about fitness and putting that together and, and just developing a program to build a community to uh get people who normally wouldn't work out to want to work out and then make a business out of it but you do have a lot of uh you got the track heads and you got people who know stats from the, from the 20s 40s 80s and um and uh you who's who has the world record in the 800 meters you know only certain people know that but there's so many people in, in high school and junior know who has the high school record in 800 meters every year every book they have to put mine they have to it's by law they have to put my name in there as a record holder and it's amazing just to see that every year i mean being a coach now for four or five years and just opening the book and seeing my name right there is just like that's crazy yeah, yeah. And, it's, and it's just been since 1996 that's something that has to be reprinted every year yeah. for for that level so it's it's uh it's a way where i'm um being at this age now is where i can appreciate it at the time i seen that as a stepping stone to whatever i was going to do next oh, i'm gonna hit 144 i'm gonna hit 140. no it's it, things happen but now i look back at it and i can really appreciate every moment every push up that i did to get to that point because it, it, it was worth it and um and then like you said too just how it's connected me with the fabric of the sport the fabric of people that i would never have met if it wasn't for that time that led to this encounter to this meeting with this person and then me putting in the work to make sure that meeting was was worthwhile to catapult me to where i am now and, and where i would like to be in the future but then as we started really kind of closing out the whole podcast i really was wondering like what type of as you've been like coaching for a little bit now in the high school game or just like what runners that have you seen in the past years or seen right now that you see yourself a lot in if that has to be from the work that they put in i mean you see in day in day out or just what they the um the times that they put on the track or how they approach the 800 or the 400. yeah so um right brandon miller is uh, the name that definitely yeah. is um, I, i've been following him since he uh went 149 that well he went 151 as an eighth grader so he i went 156 and as an eighth grader and he went 151 and i just remember my um di direct messages blowing up like I'm, i don't i don't get stuff that blows up like that but when he hit that time it's like hey uh do you know brandon miller brandon brandon's coming out to you i'm like what so i looked him up and he's a uh that's one one guy that i cheer for uh uh been following him you know he went 149 as a freshman uh yeah he did 149 as a freshman and then i think close to 148 as a 149 as a sophomore maybe he was injured last year because i didn't really hear too much from him and i was hoping this year that he would get close again that time so that's that's one guy that um i can see myself in as far as him seeing the footsteps that he's, he's going through he's gone about what four sub 410 four he's more of a miler 800 yeah some four, i think he has a 40 second, 47 second speed um so that that's one one guy that i'm cheering for and i, I, I hope that he continues going he's going to I wish him up i think at texas tech he's going to and then um the other person he's at university of washington right now he kind of actually reminds me of myself as a runner it was a bigger half miler his name is isaac green but he's a freshman, hey, you know. Yeah, I know. He, he, I know I, his sister is on the Aggies, Claire Green. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and so his uncle was a good friend of mine too on Facebook, and his uncle did. Uh, he was a coach up here too. So, uh, but no, that's one guy I, I'm cheering for as one of the bigger style runners. You know, six foot, six foot plus, two hundred pounds. I, when I ran, I was about one eighty five. So I was one of the bigger half milers at the time. And then um, another person that is close to home is a guy named uh, 
uh, Henry Green, Hank Green, he's at DePaul. He won Big Ten in the 400. Uh, I, I would think he'd be a great 800 meter runner, but he's from a long line of 400 meter runners. His um, uh, Bill Green, Bill Green is, is his grandfather. And if you look up Bill Green Jr., he held the 400 meter record, uh, high school record back in 1978, 79 on the dirt track at 45 low. And uh, rest in peace to him though, but he's, 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 uh, he's a Palo Alto legend. And it's amazing to see his lineage continue on with his uh, family member, uh, Henry over at, at uh, DePaul in the 400. He went like 46 earlier. And besides that, you know, I'm a big fan of Sydney McLaughlin and just to see amazing. She's the future of our sport after Allison. And, and um, yeah, that's that's pretty much the highlights. But then, you know, obviously Donovan Brazier as well. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then <laughs> especially like with Brandon Miller, one thing about him, I remember – I was at nationals, I want to say, when I was 12, no, not 12 years old, when I was like 13, when I was like 13 in, in like St. Louis, and he's like two years younger than me, so I seen him run, he was like a Bantam, and I was, a, no, he was a like a bottom, bottom midget, bottom. and I was yeah. a bottom youth, Oh, okay. and he, and he ran like the heat before me, and I seen him, he won like the 15, and he won the 8, and I'm all like, wait, this guy's like, He's like two seconds off of me right now. Like this man yeah. is rolling. I remember like this. I didn't, yeah. So then to see him going up through the years and like to see people like that from club become like really just like great runners. It's a great thing to see, even if they're not from SoCal. But you always like root for those guys that you've seen them in club and now they're on to bigger and better things. It's good to yeah. see that come out from the sport. It's good to see, it's good to see that. It's good for our sport. Um, yeah. To start off early like that, it's, it's good for um american uh, american track you know i would like to just continue to have that kind of cheering section that kind of uplifting within us as brothers and sisters of, in, in the same sport because that's what you know europe is doing they have this going on from the, from the club from the bottom to the top you know and yeah. and i would like to see us continue having that type of tight-knit fabric as a as a country of amazing athletes cheering each other on and hopefully getting the right mix of of hard work and that gritty kind of working out mixed with science to get us to that next level, you know? Last question we really have for you is what mark do you want to leave on the sport? I mean, you've already left a big mark on the sport. How do you want to be remembered in track and field? Uh, as a Hall of Famer, that's for one, the high school Hall of Famer. Uh, two, as a, as a coach that makes – that makes kids want to compete and push themselves. That's, you know, I, I, as an athlete, I feel like that 146 is the first thing Wikipedia says about me, so I'm going to go with it. You know, yeah. I'm going for the 800 meter uh, record holder for the 800. And that's last over 24 years. And, and at one point, I had every 800 meter record in the nation for, for, uh, for youth. And then, too, I just want to be seen as a person that's, that's just a, a resource for fitness, as a, as a, as a inspiration for, people to be better in health and, and fitness, it be it running track or who's just doing some sit-ups or having some routine in their fitness. Because what I'm noticing right now is that this is something that's keeping people sane, having an avenue to where I can be on the screen like I am now and taking us through a, a workout to where it can add some normalcy to life. It's amazing we're at a point where sometimes people want to get away from working out. Now as we understand how important it is. And if I can be anything, just to be a part of that fabric of saying, Yes, fitness is important. All right. Well, that's all we really got for you today, Michael. Uh, before we go, just want to shout out G Fit. Make sure you guys go. What's the website, Mike? GrandvilleFit.com. GrandvilleFit.com. Go on GrandvilleFit.com. Check out some Zoom workouts that he's going to have yeah. going for you guys while you guys are in the quarantine. Anything you want to say? Anything else you want to add on that on top of uh, G Fit? Hey, G Fit. Hey, we all fit in this. You know, you do my workout, and you can fit in this. You can fit in that. Let's do this. <laughs> Honor to have you on. Thanks for coming on. All right, thank you, guys. I appreciate it.
Hold on one second before y'all go, it's Joshua Potts and I just got a few closing remarks. First off, I want to just say thank you so much to Michael Granville again for coming on the Two Black Runners podcast. It really was a pleasure to really sit down with a legend, bro. So, I like this dude is like a mythical creature, like for real. That's what type of legendary status this guy has. I feel like and what he's put onto like the whole entire track world. So it really was an honor to sit down with him. His the anniversary of his national record is actually a couple days from now, May 31st. So yeah, look out for that and. And then also we just want to say if you made it to the end of this podcast either if you're watching this on youtube right now or listening to on apple or spotify or anchor or anything like that just want to make sure and just say that we really appreciate it thank you and you really are dogs bro you got two favorite black runners two favorite black runners that are your best friends that keep on hanging out because you're hanging out with us every single tuesday every single two black tuesday and with that in mind make sure you guys follow us on instagram at running underscore report subscribe to us on the runner report and we're going to be having two black runners podcasts all the time every single week trying to hit that 52 weeks straight and trying to just give this great content to y'all and without further ado bro make sure you guys check out G fit bro you got i got this i have i have to get something i have to get something to be honest bro it's great stuff there and he has great workouts for y'all if you want it want to get in that and be trained by a national record holder also one more thing just want to shout out daniel joshua make sure to stream his album bro he hooked us up with he hooked us up with michael granville bro and guys connected this situation so i want to just make sure to shout out coach o one more time and then uh, this is kind of a long outro but hey it's too black Tuesday. <laughs> that was that was for Aaron. That was for Aaron. Aaron wanted to do that. Yeah. See y'all next Tuesday though. See y'all next Tuesday.